And depending on where you're at in the country, good morning to some, happy lunch hour to others, and good afternoon to everybody else. Really glad you could join us today for this webinar on um, Canadian Transform Shelters, part of the ongoing work of the Canadian Shelter Transformation Network in the webinar series that we've been working on recently. Uh, last week, we highlighted four American shelters that have been working through the process of becoming more housing focused. And today, it's really fantastic that we have three Canadian shelters to showcase in their journey of becoming more housing focused. It's my great pleasure to turn it over to one of the co-chairs of the Canadian Shelter Transformation Network, Sandra Clarkson, who's going to walk us through an introduction and some housekeeping. Over to you, Sandra. Thanks, Ian. Uh, hello, I'm Sandra Clarkson, Executive Director of the Calgary Drop-In Centre and Co-Chair of the Canadian Shelter Transformation Network. Really happy to be here today. Um, you can find further information on the website uh, up on the screen. And I'll just do a quick run through of the agenda so you know what the, the format will be today. So we'll start with an in introduction, which is happening now. We'll turn it over to our three uh, panelists for their presentations. We will do a Q&A period uh, at the end, and then we will close out for the day. Uh, so in terms of housekeeping, everyone will be muted. Uh, please be sure to use the Q&A tab to ask your questions and we'll keep track of those. Use the chat function to share comments and speak to other participants. And this will be recorded and you can find it on the uh, transformshelter.ca website after we're done. Um, so again, please use the Q&A tab to ask questions and would like to introduce our moderator, Ian DeYoung, uh, who's active in the space of transforming shelters throughout Canada and the US. And we at the DI have had the pleasure uh, of working with Ian in our housing transformation that Kevin Webb will speak about later in this presentation. So first, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Sean. Um, Sean McKeegan from um, Men's Services, Director of Men's Services, Mission Services in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, Sean joined the team at Mission Services of Hamilton in 2016 after spending nearly a decade supporting various projects related to the municipal delivery of social assistance. He is a passionate, charismatic leader who has been unrelenting in his efforts to inspire and drive system change and end homelessness. Sean has been leading mission, mission services transformation from traditional sheltering to a housing focused sheltering model, which has been the biggest, longest running change effort. That change and the data that has accompanied that change has helped shape the foundation for an effective early intervention component, prevention and diversion, a short term housing solution and housing up an innovative and effective housing first solution that draws on the many on many of the successes facilitated by the housing focused shelter transformation. Welcome, Sean. Uh, next in our uh, panelists is James Hughes, who's the president and CEO of the Old Brewery Mission in Montreal. Uh, James has dedicated his career to the nonprofit and social services sector, playing a pivotal role in championing social inclusion and helping to reduce poverty and end chronic homelessness in Canada. As the Old Brewery Mission's president and CEO, uh, James will be stewarding the mission's vision to see the end of chronic homelessness in our lifetime. Under his watch as Director General from 2004 to 2008, the mission shifted from managing homelessness to focusing on reducing homeless, homelessness permanently through long-term solutions. Um, Mr. Hughes comes to us from the J.W. McConnell Foundation, a philanthropic foundation dedicated to developing and applying innovative approaches to social, cultural, economic, and environmental challenges. Um, he currently sits on the board of directors of the Queen Elizabeth Health Centre in Montreal, the Governance Committee of the Children's Aid, Aid Foundation of Canada, uh, the Comité de Coordination of the COSI, here's my French accent, oh dear, of the Collective de Fondations Québécois contre les inégalités and is the volunteer president of the Provincial Employment Roundtable sponsored by Yes Montreal. My sincere apologies if I bungled up that French speaking. Um, in the role of New Brunswick's Deputy Minister of the Department of Social Development, Mr. Hughes was central to the development of the province's trailblazing poverty reduction strategy through a widely acclaimed citizen engagement process. 
He also oversaw the implementation of the new directions initiative in child welfare and legislation to protect residents in long-term care facilities. And lastly, he is the editor of Beyond Shelters, Solutions to Homeless Homelessness in Canada from the Front Lines. As an author, his publications include Early, Inter Early Intervention, how Canada's social programs can work better, save lives, and often save money, a bipartisan approach to Aboriginal affairs, homelessness closing the gap between ability and performance, and why we can't afford poverty. Uh, thank you, James. We look forward to seeing your presentation. And lastly, we have Kevin Webb, uh, who I'm very familiar with as he's the Senior Manager of Housing and Employment at the Calgary Drop-In Centre. Um, and we are a housing focused low barrier emergency shelter. Kevin is passionate about housing, shelter transformation and educating the community about engagement with marginalized and vulnerable populations. He's an accredited residential property manager, a master trainer for Rent Smart, and is a member of the Canadian Shelter Transformation Network. Kevin is currently working towards a BA in leadership and is committed to helping people develop professionally. Thank you, Kevin. I look forward to seeing your presentation as well. Uh, thank you, Ian. Back over to you. Thanks, Sandra. What a great lineup we have for today, and we should not spend any more time. Uh, we should just talking about it. We should get into it. And so it's my great pleasure to uh, have Sean uh, kick us off with walking through their experience at Mission Services in Hamilton. Sean, over to you. So while I'm going to, uh, let's see if this is a rookie Zoom exercise here, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen, it's as simple as that. If you click share screen, it should start simply that way, yep. Yeah. All right, let's. There we go. All right, so uh, thanks for the introduction. Certainly happy to be here with uh, everybody. Uh, this topic is, Certainly a passionate, uh, a passionate one for me and for the staff and for everybody that works at Mission Services. Of course, I'm the director of Men's Services and uh, not wasting any more time on that bio. Uh, you're certainly welcome to go and look at that or reach out to us if you want to talk uh, any more about it. But we'll get right into uh, our transformation exercise, which has, you know, we're now four and a half years or so into that. So what we're, I want to start with, and if you're, I'll start like this and and I know that this might feel a little bit unorthodox, but just bear me out. Um, if you're like me, and maybe if you're not like me, or you're just like one of 98 million other people, last week you watched Tom Brady win his seventh Super Bowl, his fifth Super Bowl MVP at 40 year, 43 years old. So 20, 20 or so years uh, from the first time that he reached the pinnacle of success in his sport. Now, we look at Tom Brady and imagine... Uh, how does he sustain that level of success for 20 years, uh, continue to be, of course, widely revered as the greatest uh, player to have ever played the game? And we assume that that success was natural, God-given ability. But if you've ever watched football, you know that Tom Brady is not necessarily the best athlete to ever play the game. Uh, you know that uh, he has had to overcome challenges and he has worked uh, incredibly hard uh, to sustain that level of excellence. But he is not being without his uh, shortcomings or failures or mistakes either. So besides those seven Super Bowls and those five MVP Super Bowl or the MVP trophies that he has to go along with that, he's also lost 69 times. He's lost on the biggest stage. Uh, he's got three Super Bowl losses to his credit. He's thrown 191 interceptions and he's fumbled the ball 125 times. So you want to ask the question, then, what is Tom Brady's secret to this sustained success, and how does he continue to achieve uh, what seems to defy logic at 43 years old? And one of the things that I certainly take away from that, it isn't his God-given abilities uh, on the whole. It is his unrelenting commitment to continuous improvement. So every year, he has worked to get better. Uh, 20 years later, even at 43, he believed he could win uh, another Super Bowl. He elevates the play of his teammates. That unrelenting commitment has certainly shown itself out in, in, in the success that he's realized. Now, for us, 
In 2016, when I, when I first arrived, in order for us to understand what we were doing right and what we might be doing wrong, what we could do better, we needed to take a look at what it was we were even doing. So when we looked at that and we said, okay, let's start by taking a look at how many people we've actually housed. And we saw in 2016, it looked like 167 people. And then we looked at the number of times that we were engaged with those individuals and we had 275 engagements. And if we were to stop there, you might ask, why would you want to transform at all? Because that appears to be the most efficient housing exercise ever. If you're averaging one and a half engagements before a person realizes a housing placement, that doesn't seem like something that you want to necessarily change. But what you'll see at the end is our staff unplanned absences. We knew that staff weren't engaged and invested the way that we needed them to be if we were going to be effective. We were averaging people calling in sick, uh, you know, two or three times a week in some instances, every week, all year long. And for a 24-7 operation, you know, that that's a challenge, but we wanted to understand why uh, people didn't love the work the way that I did. Um, we looked at then we began in earnest in 2017, and while working closely with our partners, there are two other men's shelters in the city of Hamilton, and we work pretty closely with one another. And to realize the type of change that we wanted, we knew that we needed to work closely with those partners as well. And then as a system, and keep in mind our system has uh, just under 200 emergency shelter beds. We have 58. And we realized as a system, our, uh, collectively, the three men's shelters, 388 housing placements. But we put an emphasis on making sure that we could quantify our engagements. So you see those engagements year over year from 2016 to 2017. We go from 275 engagements to 4,400 plus uh, client engagements. Housing focused engagements is what we're chasing there. So that still doesn't tell us a lot. We think 388 looks good and 4,400 engagements feels like we're now doing something, but we noticed a significant drop off in the number of unplanned absences as we began to assign value to the work and individuals who were actually performing the duties understood the value. So we saw unplanned absences decrease by half. Uh, and this is the same staff. This wasn't discipline actions. This wasn't terminating people or anything like that. This was uh, people feeling invested in the work. So from 2017 to 2018, still from that system perspective, we see a bit of a drop off in those housing placements. Now this might be where uh, some would look and say, gosh, maybe we're doing something wrong because we're not housing as many people as we did last year. Maybe we should go back and do what we did in 2017, which is the wrong thing to do. We know that this transformation process takes time and, and, and in order to understand where you are in that, the data needs to inform what you're doing. We're not looking to make rash decisions. We know that we still didn't have enough data at that point. 2016's data was, as you can see, basically junk and worthless. So now we're 18 months in and we're looking at what we see in 2018. The engagements went down. And we attributed a little bit of that to a honeymoon period and a hardening period, people trying to understand the work. And the unplanned absences stayed pretty consistent. By the time we got to 2019, and what we're looking at there, now as a system, we see those year over year changes. We go from 332 placements to 512. So us along with our partners are now housing people at a much greater a uh, much greater weight rate than we had been before. And if you see in the second, uh, the second box, again, when we look at client engagements, they've come back up and we noticed a correlation between the number of engagements and the number of housing outcomes. But in the last slide, you see, we reduced again unplanned absence, again with the same cohort of staff by, half, by almost half again. So the success uh, began to, you know, to really take root where individuals, staff uh, from every, from every uh, uh, position in, in the department certainly began to feel like they were making a difference, beginning to see the results of that. Those outcomes of the engagements were bearing the sort of fruit that we were expecting to see. But it was very much an exercise in being unrelenting in that commitment to continuous improvement. If we follow Tom Brady's model and we ask ourselves, what's his secret? If his secret was that unrelenting commitment to success, 
then we need to we need to follow that same path. This is not something that takes weeks or months. This can, in some instance, take a year or a year and a half or more. And we see this exercise as one that we want to continue to chase, and we have. Now, taking this data, and this was a really interesting one. So while we saw those housing placements increase significantly from 2018 to 2019, the biggest change, and when we began to look at this, this is the recidivism data. So individuals returning uh, from a housing placement to homelessness, we saw at 43%, what we were doing in 2018 wasn't a, a glowing example of success. But in 2019, along with the 512 placements, we saw a huge reduction in the rate of recidivism. So the work that we were doing, the engagements that we were have, wasn't just resulting in greater outcomes, but it was resulting in greater sustainability of those outcomes. To see significant reductions like that in recidivism, means that the engagements aren't just focused on realizing a placement, those engagements are focused also on ensuring that there's going to be sustainability attached to those. So that transformation process, the way that this reveals itself is certainly something that staff can relate to and staff understand. We always think that it's most exciting if somebody leaves and we don't see them again, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's nice to know that they're not coming back because they're housed. Now, one of the most exciting pieces uh, that we saw, and I, and I do want to touch on this because this one was sort of mind-blowing for me. It did not happen overnight, and it was not something that we were going to glean in a few weeks or even a few months. But one of the things that we noticed was this. So when we were completing our assessments with individuals, so we were using the VI spit out as an assessment tool and we're again, using it to inform how we, how we shape service, not using it to say, well, if you're a high acuity individual, you go over here and you're moderate and you get that service, you go over there. You're a low acuity person, you go over there. We still work with everyone the exact same way. Everyone is still experiencing homelessness regardless of their acuity. It just gave us a greater insight or a greater understanding as to what we might have to do in order to help you know, realize a housing outcome with them. So the low acuity group, I'll lay these numbers down at the bottom so you know that this isn't something that we did with say 50 or 100 engagements. This, this, this information here was based on uh, what we collected from 3,000 plus unique individuals, 23,000 plus client engagements and north of 650 permanent housing outcomes. So what we found in that data and, and again, this is information that simply fell out of this exercise. If you were a low acuity or somebody that would have been assessed as a low acuity individual, we, what we were able to glean is that it took six engagements before that individual would realize a housing placement on average. And I've rounded them up and down to the nearest whole number, which is really quite, uh, quite exciting, I thought. For a moderate acuity individual, what we found was that it took on average 12 engagements or twice as many as the low acuity. And for the high acuity group, it was 24 engagements on average before they realized a housing placement. What that did, and when we discovered this, because it wasn't scripted, we didn't say if they're high acuity, meet with them 24 times, if they're moderate, meet with them 12, and if they're low, meet with them six. But what this did when we understood it, and it took a while to understand it, what this meant was when you get these questions with someone's working with an individual who might be a high acuity individual according to their initial assessment and they'd say and we'd have staff that would say things like well, i'm not sure if we're going to get this person housed like this person's really complex it, it put management staff in a position where they could say well how many times have we met with them and you'd hear things like well i've met with them a few times now but from our perspective then we could say well get back to work because I know that on average, it takes 24 times before you're going to see, realize a housing placement. So we still got work to do. Conversely, if you had somebody meeting with a moderate acuity individual and they've met 30 times, you might ask the question, what's going on? You've met with them 30 times. We know on average, based on those 3,000 individuals and those 23,000 engagements, that it takes 12 times. So where are we with that? And you might hear something like, oh, we're doing really good. We're making a lot of progress. We've got a great rapport. Yeah, that's nice. But I think it's time to talk about something different because on average, if it takes 12 times, what are we missing here? So it allowed us to really focus in, knowing that the data supported that, focus in on 
you know, how we would engage, knowing that there was a framework to sort of follow along. And I'll sort of conclude now with this slide because, and again, I think the over under, at least for the staff that I work with, was, oh, Sean will get cut off. And yeah, this is entirely possible that I might have, but the question, because our goal is to end homelessness. And one of the things that we know here is that we absolutely can. It's not a question of how will we do it or you know, what needs to happen or do we need billions of dollars of investment here or there? Those are all important things, but it's pretty basic. We know that we can end homelessness and the data will bear this out too because every individual we have served ever has been housed before. Nobody that we are serving has been homeless forever. They have all been housed before. Just like Tom Brady, when he comes and plays and says, you know what, I can go back out and win another Super Bowl. And I know that we can do that because we've done it before. The same is true for the individuals we support. The data helps inform these things when you're armed with that information and you know that the process is one of continuous improvement. The individuals that we're working, individuals that are experiencing homelessness have all been housed before and they can all be housed again. I'll turn it back. Wow, to Sean. Thank you. And uh, perfect timing. Uh, great takeaways from there. <clears throat> I'm just going to, as James is uh, getting his screen ready, I'm going to remind people that you can put your questions and answers into the Q&A tab. As we go through, if you have specific questions for Sean and what he presented today, we will be coming around to questions at the end. Just want to encourage people to use the Q&A tab, not the chat tab for questions. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to James, who uh, is going to walk us through uh, their work and what it means uh, for understanding shelter transformation towards being housing focused uh, based upon the Montreal story. James, you're on mute. All right. Can, uh, can you hear me okay? Because I'm just looking at my screen right now and I want to make sure I've got audio. We're good. Okay, great. Yeah, hi everyone. So um, um, I like uh, like Sean, like everyone else, is super happy to be here with you to talk a little bit about uh, our journey, which is really uh, I'd, I'd say underway, far from complete, um, and and lots to do. But um, I hope there may be some some pieces in here that uh, uh, that may be helpful to everyone. So um, I'm. Um, here today uh, from Montreal, donc uh, je voulais juste vous dire uh, un petit bonjour de uh, la belle province uh, de ma ville, Montréal, uh, which is minus 19 uh, right now, super cold, um, and um, we're still uh, in the middle of COVID uh, and, and taking on that every day, but uh, just like you, um, we, 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 we are thinking about housing and how uh, to constantly improve how we become more and more housing focused. And uh, let me just talk to you a little bit about our, our journey in that regard. So just in terms of journeys, wow, well, like we've been around for a long time, like many of you, um, we're a, a social gospel uh, founded organization in 1889 um, of the Methodist kind. Uh, the Old Bury is coming up to 131 years old. Um, having been founded in an old brewery. It was an abandoned uh, brewery and um, soup uh, was served and the name stuck and continues to stick to this day. So from those humble beginnings, uh, we've uh, become um, uh, the largest um, uh, organization in the province serving uh, homeless men and women. And like Sean uh, was saying, our, our, our goal uh, has been very simple. I think just like uh, many of you, um, the turn came um, uh, in the early 2000s when uh, we had become an organization that had simply been offering emergency services. Um, in 1993, we had 150 beds under management through the period of austerity that we all know about that followed through the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, we increased the number of beds under management of 
of emergency service kind to 450. Um, it was during that time when most shelters across the country uh, grew uh, uh, in terms of their humanitarian service offering. Uh, we all did that because that's what we knew what to do. That's what we'd been doing for, in some cases, over 100 years. Uh, and this traditional way of sheltering was just leaving people um, managing within misery uh, on a on a day-to-day -day basis. We, of course, like so many others, invited people to leave during the day. Good luck. Go find yourself a job and a home. Uh, come back this evening if if um, if you haven't succeeded, and we'll be here for you to provide you again with these basic services. So as I say, from, from about 2006 forward, we said enough of that. We've got to start to treat our services as pretexts. Emergency services can't be the end. They have to, of course, be the pretext to work with people, to finally get to know them through a case management system, uh, ensuring that they have the basic services uh, as well as the information and the relationships to start their journey uh, as quickly as possible out, uh, out of the shelter. And um, that has been our journey since that time. Um, we are, um, have grown uh, significantly since then, as I'll talk to you about, mostly on the housing side, while significantly reducing our services on the uh, emergency side. Uh, we no longer actually even talk about the shelter anymore. We talk simply about emergency services. Um, it's a question I would, I, I would ask all of us. Are, are, if, if we are housing focused shelters, um, are we, um, are, have we got the right language anymore when we, when we think in those terms? In Montreal, as I say, the, the language of refuge or shelter is actually uh, increasingly on the decline just because of the changing nature uh, of the, these organizations that we run. So today we, we manage um, a number of uh, housing uh, uh, projects uh, in the community. We have 322 units of housing under management in various kinds and various forms. Um, all uh, for now, uh, for uh, either women or men, studios, uh, one and a half uh, single, uh, single rooms, um, all with, um, uh, uh, in different parts of the city. We have a scattered site um, arrangement with our uh, housing bureau here as well to provide rent supplements so individuals can choose their own uh, place uh, and we bring along to them in community, uh, in private apartments, uh, rent supplements and uh, community support services. We're delighted to have a, a research team um, uh, and a partnership with McGill to help us track some of our, our, our work. We continue, of course, to offer uh, the front door services uh, that no doubt uh, many of you offer as well. Also right across town, we um, uh, continue to provide these, these basic services to all of our clients. Health services as well is a key part of it. Uh, and of course, we do that in partnership with uh, our local health services. Um, the PRISM project, for instance, is um, uh, for those suffering from serious mental illness. Uh, and we have a community and medical teams that work with them right here within the facilities uh, uh, with a residential component uh, so that we can stabilize and move them into community as fast as possible. We're actually just opening up our um, first, the Montreal's first managed alcohol program. And uh, in terms of the future of our our health services, we uh, are of the, the view that um, adapting our services to clients increasingly is one of the main themes that we'll see in, in our emergency service array. Uh, not just um, being satisfied with being able to serve those who uh, are able to conform to our existing programs, but constantly expanding um, the kinds of services, the kinds of staffing that we can offer so that we can serve, frankly, everyone who's in homelessness and not just those who are adapted to the service uh, offerings that we have. The same is true for our women's services. Very, very proud. It's been the fastest uh, growing part of our business and fastest growing. It, not so much that the, um, 
the, the, the number of women in homelessness has been growing uh, any more quickly than anywhere else in, in, in the city or anywhere else in your cities, but it's that we've been able to respond much more quickly um, uh, in terms of the growth of our response to um, uh, homelessness amongst women in a, in a very, I think, very diversified and very humane way. Same thing for, for women. Let's stop here. This is, the, um, this is actually the cover. Uh, this photo is the cover of the Beyond Shelters book that uh, we put together a few years ago. Um, very, very proud of that work. It's this, the, the phenomenon of, of the transformation of our services uh, towards a housing orientation is, uh, is not uh, restricted to one city. It's right across uh, the country from Newfoundland to Vancouver to Yellowknife. Everyone is working at that at, and at different uh, speeds and in different ways. Um, we're proud in Montreal that in terms of recidivism, we're at uh, um, uh, in, in the high 80s, early 90s, depending upon clientele in terms of the number of people that are, are in a position to uh, use their housing to move on to the next, um, to the next um, spot. And uh, uh, only around 10% of people seem to be returning to, uh, to our facilities. Um, we, we, I would say uh, at this juncture that data is our, our biggest challenge uh, in, in Montreal in general. We really are driving blind on many, many uh, issues. Uh, coordinated access has not yet arrived uh, in any way in, in our city. Um, we're wanting, I think I'm speaking for all the organizations in Montreal, wanting to have that common access point, common protocols for referral, common data uh, system, but we're finding right now that we're um, very weak uh, in terms of knowing how well we are doing as organizations and as a system. Uh, and over the next few years, regional approaches of these kinds uh, hopefully will take uh, a much bigger, uh, much bigger place. And I think I'm going to stop it right there. Um, needless to say, we're absolutely delighted to be working with the other four large organizations here in Montreal. Maybe, maybe you're on the phone uh, on the Zoom call with us. But they're amazing. Uh, we, we, we can't, uh, no one organization can reduce and end homelessness uh, by itself. Uh, and in Montreal, there's that, that is uh, entirely true. And uh, including our public partners as well. So I'd, I'd perhaps just say, uh, in terms of what comes next um, for us, um, uh, uh, prevention uh, that was mentioned by Sean, we're, we're I think, at, at at while we are, um, with everyone who's working on rapid rehousing uh, initiative, federal money, I think we're going to all be getting more doors to manage uh, going forward. I think we're all increasingly adept in terms of the, the quality uh, and number of uh, health services and housing services we're providing that accompany journey outside of homelessness. I think the next big transformation we're all going to have to start to see if we're really going to see the numbers come down is on the prevention side. And I Look forward to future webinars of the CSTN, looking specifically at how our organizations can be involved in the prevention conversation. Thank you so much, James. Appreciate that. And so many interesting things going on for us to take in so far in both presentations. Again, I will encourage people to use that Q&A function. I see a few questions have been put in there already, and we will circle back to those uh, after we hear from Kevin, who is now going to put up his presentation and walk us through the story of the transformation uh, that has occurred at the Calgary Drop-In Centre. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you, Ian and Sandra and the Canadian Shelter Transformation Network for putting this together today. One second, Kevin, just so you know, we can see your next coming slide. Uh, I don't know if you wanted it to be in that view, but uh, no. Okay. Bear I just thought you'd want to have like, you know, the best possible uh, uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, totally. You know, so I'll give you a second just to get that technology all set up the way that you want it. And sorry to interrupt.
are we there? Good, Ian. Perfect. Thank Good. you. Um, so again, thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm representing the Calgary Drop-In Center. So some brief history on the DI. We opened in uh, 1950 um, and have kind of evolved over time, but presently this is our, our location. Um, we have just over a thousand shelter bed a night uh, in one location um, and then an overflow shelter of about 120. That's obviously non-COVID time. During COVID, we've had to reduce those numbers by about 50%. Present programs that we offer at the DEI are health services, diversion services, case management, employment services, and victim services. We also have a free goods program, um, which is open to all low-income Calgarians, um, which is household goods, food, um, clothing, and our Click Lab, which is our low-income uh, computer program. And we also run three mixed market buildings. So one of the questions was asked for today was why? Why did we make this move? Um, you know, there's all kinds of different reasons on really why we did it. You know, there's over the decades, shelters have brought in all these services into the building, trying to be the central location for, for individuals experiencing homelessness. And we tried that. And as you can see in 2017, this is our emergency shelter daily average numbers. We were, our numbers were so high, we needed to start to look at doing something different. And our executive director saw a, um, a talk that Ian did and kind of walked away with one of those light bulb moments that this is, this is where we need to go. We need to go to become housing focused. Um, we wanted to become an engine to end homelessness. And we wanted to be those people that walked alongside individuals experiencing homelessness on ending their homelessness. So how did we get to this point and how did we start? So in 2017, we made the declaration that that's it, we're gonna be housing focused. And we knew this was gonna be a gigantic um, change and it was gonna take a lot of time and that it was something we couldn't do on our own. Um, so we engaged Org Code and Ian and had him come out and spend a week with us, really look at all of our operations and all of our procedures and shadow staff and see what we needed to do to become housing focused. So he came up with 85 recommendations. Um, this word cloud is actually almost all of them. And I think when he presented it to us, that's what my brain felt like, was like, how are we gonna get through this? What are we gonna do? This is gonna be crazy. And we decided that we really needed to start with some, some fast wins, some fast and easy wins to get that staff engagement, to get the client engagement. Um, so we did, we started by doing the staff engagement and then examining our programs. Um, we had a number of programs in the building that were there and they were very community-based and that's not a bad thing, but if we wanna be housing focused, there's a lot of that stuff in the community. So let's get people into the community to do those things. So we need to look at that and start to close some, some programs. We also need to take some time and look at our barring procedures. Uh, if we wanted to be a low barrier shelter, housing focused, you know, we wanted to take some time to really dig into those and make them more, um, less punitive and, and more really about serving the individuals. And then starting the training on uh, housing conversations and how we can do that. And then I love this. Ian talked about it when he was out there, but it's that creating that positive disruption. And we did that by doing little things like, you know, being on our, on our um, second floor, talking about housing, shutting off TVs, like all those little things really made a difference. I think the first thing that we really wanted to do was make resources easily available for staff. So you can see on, we have a, how to plant a housing seed. This was our first kind of like step into housing where we created lanyards for the staff where they could just take these and have that elevator pitch where it's like, how do I start a conversation with housing? And it was that first step. Um, I think if you walk around the building now, most of those are probably all tattered and ripped up and everything from everyone holding them, trying to have conversations. And then we took that those lanyards and those resources and made them available for staff a little further where 
you know, we had things about the barring and about the mental health continuum for those individuals, not for like for us as staff, not for clients. And then on the, you can see here, we have the uh, landlord, uh, how to view a, a rental. We created a number of one, we call them one pagers. And there are a number of these quick reference guides for individuals that, you know, just come up to a frontline staff and ask, you know, I found an apartment, but I'm unsure how to email somebody. So these really quick kind of like self resolving guides for individuals. Um, it was to help the clients, but also to help staff. So it was a training tool for staff as they start to use these more. Um, and we've taken these now and created them into posters. So they're all over the building. We really want housing to be everywhere. Um, with a, our redesign of our website, we've added all these things onto our website as well. So individuals can, uh, can access them. So this was kind of like some of those first easy wins. We knew that this was gonna be a really long journey and it wasn't going to be something that we could do overnight. Um, you know, one of the things with our building and our, and our shelter being so huge, like Ian's quote when he did his presentation to us is that the DI is bigger than some entire systems of care. It can act as its own internal triaging, prioritizing, prioritizing people throughout the various programs with an unrelenting focus on housing. I took that and that's how I want to design each of our programs by looking at our data and really take the time to understand that, yeah, we are so big that it's a, it's a different world than a lot of shelters. So some of the things that we've done so far is really concentrated on our diversion program. One of the things that we found was we could have a diversion program, but people moved into the shelter and they would easily get lost in the shelter. So we ended up creating a space in our main building where new clients came into there and were, were just worked on with diversion staff for up to 21 days. That's kind of evolved already. And because of COVID, we've been able to move that into its own shelter, um, that 120 person overflow shelter I spoke about earlier. What we've seen with that has actually been incredible. Um, our, our days in shelter have shrunk. Um, but one of, I think the coolest things is how many times you hear the conversations actually between clients now talking about, let's end our homeless together, homelessness together. Like, hey, did you do this today? Hey, did you do that today? Are you working on your housing plan? And then we created a housing hub, um, which is I like to call the 7-Eleven of housing. So anyone can go in there at any time and there's resources, a computer, there's someone staffing it um, that we can just have those conversations. Really worked with housing specialists, um, trying to in integrate that into the shelter. Our healthcare um, that we have in the building, we're, we're bringing that into the housing focus now. And those healthcare workers are having the housing conversations. We're working on the programs together. We're working on internal triage tools, um, using data to drive all of our programs, and then really want that housing, health, and shelter housing plans and that seamless internal transfer. So because we have shelter, because we have housing, because we have health, we want them to all work together on individual housing plans um, with the clients. Some of the challenges that we faced uh, early on in the in the transformation. And I think that this is goes with any major culture change in an organization, but is that staff buy-in? So some of the mitigating factors that we found with that was we did a lot of transformation talks where we were very open and honest, kind of like, you know, just come come and ask us whatever you want to ask us, and we're gonna answer you as openly and honestly as possible. Um, we brought in newsletters, we started to openly share our outcomes. Um, involving all staff at the different levels of the engagement. So as we were going through, we were doing, we did some staff um, focus groups on projects we were starting, trying to start. Again, those easy wins, some housing campaigns. So we did, we've ran two different housing campaigns now and really try to get that going. 
And then the client buy-in, um, again, the same type of situations where we looked at those long-term individuals that have been at the shelter. We have people that stayed in our shelter for 10, 15, 20 years, and we wanted to target those people. And then there's the change fatigue, um, which comes with any culture change or any change management. And, you know, we started to see that. So really plotting out the changes. When we first got the Ian recommendations, I have to say that we jumped in, like we were like, let's do this, let's change this, let's go, let's go, we're so excited. But needed to know that we weren't the only people in the agency, you know, organizing uh, different departments like HR or IT or maintenance, all have ongoing projects as well. So really taking that into one project management area and prioritizing so that Yes, we're doing the housing focus, but there's all this other stuff going on that's gonna cause the change fatigue as well. And then Sandra um, started the Ask Sandra Anything where we were committed to answering questions. It's an anonymous feedback loop. Um, and then the other challenge I think we all face is the rental market. And you know we spent a lot of time actually analyzing the different rental markets in the city talking to clients. And I think the biggest thing is that we altered our own perspective of what housing is. You know, we all want a one bedroom apartment in like, you know, on the seventh floor overlooking the river. Um, but we needed to really take the time to alter that and look at that, you know, not everyone wants that, right? Let's look at what the client wants and move forward with that. Some of the comments that we heard during the initial stages of the transformation where, you know, all clients are high acuity, they can't be housed without supports. I don't totally agree with that. Um, we do have many clients that are high acuity. Every time through COVID that we've had to make an adjustment and open a new shelter or open a new program and move people here and move people there, by looking at our data and really doing our internal triaging, Every time that we've done that, we've found more and more clients that have flown under the radar um, that are houseable. And I think even the idea of high acuity, you know, a lot of those individuals can live on their own with minimal supports as long as we have the proper engagements with them. Um, another one is that people should be housing ready. And my simple answer to this is that, you know, we honestly tried that for however many years. Um, by bringing all the services into the building. The housing first model is a proven model um, that has worked for years now. And that if we maintain that, we'll see the outcomes that I'm gonna show you guys in the center in a minute. And then again, that Calgary rental market is too expensive. Um, yeah, we do have an expensive rental market like right across Canada. Um, but really, again, altering what my own personal perspectives on what housing is for an individual um, has helped with that. You know, we will use situations like rooming houses, but have the conversations with the clients about that this is a stepping stone, right? It's, the, it's really incorporating that housing first philosophy into what we're doing. This is, um, I wanted to show this and really demonstrate how when we kick up a new program or start to look at a program, um, how we want to make it housing focused. So this was part of a COVID response and we were fortunate enough to um, secure a 83 room hotel for six months. We wanted to take this program and really make it housing focused, not just an extension of the shelter, but take it. So what we did is we designed a transitional housing program for the six month period. Um, staffing was housing focused. We had time to train the staff. The clients knew when they came into the program that it was a, you know, we wanted to get you housed within, ideally we wanted them to be housed in 30 days. Um, what we actually found was that um, it was on average for the 128 people that we housed in that six months, that it was about 60 days. So just wanted to demonstrate that any of the situations that we walk into, any of the new shelters that throughout the, the pandemic, that we're really trying to go housing focused on it all. 
So does it work, right? Does this housing focus shelter thing work? And um, the data doesn't lie. Um, if I look at our average daily numbers, um, if I take January of 2017, we averaged about a thousand people a night. Um, if I look at January 2020, we're down to 751 people a night. And you can see through this chart that it's just as the further we've go, gone along in our journey, those numbers continue to decrease. Um, obviously, when we hit, you know, April, May, June, July of this year, we've, we've got into COVID, so our numbers have drastically dropped. And we're trying to, to anticipate where we where we're going to land after COVID. So um, just to show our housing numbers, um, you know, in 2020, throughout COVID, we were still able to house 428 people. You can see that our return to shelter rates are extremely low, where we're sitting at seven or, you know, on average about 2%. We've continued to reduce our chronic shelter numbers. In 2017, we were around 386. Uh, just before COVID, we were down to 181. Um, I can tell you and show you data, but really, um, this is going to be up on the the uh, the presentation. It'll be shared, but this is really just a letter from a client that's saying congratulations and yes, it does work. He saw some people get housed, and then I think where does this where do we go from here? We're still in our transformation. We're not close to being done. 2021 is going to be about relooking at those recommendations that Ian made, see where we're at. Um, we're spending a lot of time analyzing our data and forming partnerships with other housing providers. Um, you know, we're not there yet. It's a long journey, but uh, it's been a really fun journey. And it's been amazing to see how many people actually get a key and a house and haven't returned to us and get those letters like this that say, say that they're just happy to be there. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin and James and Sean. It's my pleasure now to facilitate questions for a few minutes. We may go a little bit over. Uh, we're welcome to stay uh, if you want to, but let's see if we can uh, deal with some of these questions uh, quickly. Uh, so the first one, Sean, is to you and it's how does mission services define an engagement. So you use some stats around engagement. What exactly does that mean? So uh, excellent question. I'm glad somebody asked it because uh, with a limited amount of time, I knew I couldn't really exhaustively go through these things. But an engagement is a housing related, if you're having a housing focused conversation or a housing related conversation, that's an engagement. So it doesn't have to be these sit down 45 minute meetings. And in fact, it shouldn't be. If you're regularly engaged, you should be following up on the types of actions that people have. But the biggest key for us was to find a place within HIFIS to make sure that we were capturing that easy or easily. So frontline staff needed to be able to capture those engagements far quicker than it took the engagements to, to happen. So if you're meeting with someone for 10 or 15 minutes, you're having a housing focused conversation, that's an engagement, but you have to be able to capture that in HIFIS so we can actually report on that. And it shouldn't take you more than a, you know, 45 seconds or a minute to pop your note into to HIFIS. So we needed to make that process easy. A housing focused conversation or housing related conversation is an engagement. Thanks, Sean. Asking them about their lunch is not. Right. Um, James, I'm gonna throw this one over to you and then Kevin, you can chime in on this one as well. This is related to health services in particular. Uh, so who do you partner with for health services? What type of organization and what does the arrangement look like? So maybe, just a few comments uh, that you can make relative to how did health services come into your environment and uh, what does that arrangement look like now? So I'll, I'll give the, uh, the example of our, our um, uh, managed alcohol program, um, which is, is fresh. Um, so the, the, the relationship and the development of it's really fresh. In, in Quebec, uh, we have um, um, what are called the, uh, well, regional health authorities and the regional health authority for Montreal um, there's actually a number in Montreal, but the one that has the, the homelessness file was the one with whom we've been negotiating the terms of the program. Um, and it's essentially what, you know, there, it becomes a, a government priority, becomes part, therefore, of the regional health plan. 
Um, that's obviously uh, that takes advocacy and time to get these kinds of initiatives within the, those pl within those plans. And once they're in there, government usually has a call out for proposals. And um, in the case of the managed alcohol program, um, we were the organization that was invited to partner with them to. Um, put this together so um, the parameters are within uh, are, are within the call and we uh, uh, proposed to them uh, a method of working on a pilot basis initially and with a with a obviously an expansion over time um, with with everything from the staffing our expectations of um, uh, the presence of medical staff um, for the obvious reasons that in the case of any any health program um, it, you need clinical and medical presence um, that's negotiated, usually day services, rarely night services, but usually it comes with, with residential uh, and uh, other types of community-based services, which is what we offer. So we actually sign an entente um, with them to, to co-manage this project. Um, and it includes um, budgets for everything from um, staffing to cigarettes and alcohol, uh, uh, refrigerators uh, to keep the alcohol and um, and so on. So it's it's um, it's the same is true with our, our mental mental health program. You know, we provide the residential basis, the um, the, the community based services around it. They um, um, tuck in the medical services, uh, and and together we offer um, to a, a defined clientele this 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 program, which is for Montreal. It's not just for Oldbury. Uh, referrals. It's for any organization. So there's a whole communications piece that go with that. COVID has kind of cut the, the launch of the pilot, um, but it looks like uh, April 1st, we'll be able to get going on it again. Kevin, a few words on health services and their integration with the DI and how that uh, is organized would be great. We do have internal um, healthcare specialists on staff, but really have partnered with um, Alberta Health Services on some some different like different programs, as well as um, other agencies within the city that do healthcare. Um, you know, we have specific uh, homeless based agencies that do healthcare services. So by partnering with them and bringing them in to do it, but also partnering with them to get the clients from our building over to their buildings. Um, to start with that community reintegration piece um, has been been key for us. Kevin, the next one's going to you as well because it's directly related, uh, directly addressed to you. It says, hey, Kevin, I'd love to know more about the housing campaigns, their structure, success rates, and what were the aims of these? So we've ran two different campaigns now. Uh, we started off with one um, early on where we called it the 100 Keys campaign. And our goal was to house 100 people in four weeks. Um, the success rate, we ended up hitting, I think it was 111 in the four weeks. Um, structure was very much about kind of boots on the ground. We just took all of our housework, housing workers, as well as um, some frontline staff, and just kind of hit the ground and were like in the face of everyone about housing, saying that we could do this. Um, and the aim was twofold. One, obviously, to end individuals' homelessness, but to start that buzz in the building and in, in the agency around housing. Um, Andrew, uh, if you'd like to know more in-depth details on it, um, send me an email and uh, we can certainly talk one-on-one -on -one about it as well. I uh, will go to the next question. Uh, James, I'm going to throw this one over to you. Uh, you know, the next phase of our strategies may focus on prevention. Are there some specific models of prevention you're looking at or tactics you're developing? Yeah, this is, this is going to be a really exciting uh, conversation for all of us. As I said, I, I, I hope the CSTN, you know, we, we've got a lot of things to do, but I, I do think that should be a note of work that we think about uh, because, I mean, we are, we are the social safety net of the social safety net, right? I mean, um, we know, for instance, in Montreal, 60% of young people on the street under the age of 30 have gone through the child protection system. So those touches on child protection uh, were a chance to make sure that uh, assessment was done for homelessness risk and diversion was successfully completed. What is the legal mandate 
uh, and resources available, staffing available, training available for uh, systems such as child protection, but also correctional services, uh, also mental health services, uh, more hospital-based services and, and other public institutions to actually prevent homelessness. And what is the role of organizations like ours uh, in encouraging um, that, that conversation, that debate, that, that advocacy for the reform of our institutions from whom we receive such a large percentage of our clientele. So just in terms of um, what we're talking about, we're, uh, as I think I mentioned in the presentation, we have a very strong relationship with McGill and we're talking to them about a policy collaborative around how we can bring community resources and our experience to bear uh, with the academy to together start to think about what kind of um, uh, policy changes right down to uh, laws, regulations, budgets um, that may make a difference in how institutions address it. That's not the only way, of course, to think about the prevention issue. It can't be the only way. There's all, all kinds of other ways, uh, you know, in terms of rent banks, um, um, uh, eviction prevention and all that kind of thing. But those are some of the, those are some of the arcs on the prevention circle um, that we should, as I say, as a group, start to think about uh, together uh, in time. So I see a few other questions here. Uh, one being, <clears throat> as a funder, not government funder, so dollars are limited and not a service provider, how are there examples where leaders outside the shelter system instigated changes in the system? I don't know for any of the three of you, if your impetus to move in this direction was, uh, I think was more internal than it was external. Uh, but I would still say that there's a role for uh, those um, uh, people who do want to see system change, that do want to uh, drive forward in ways that uh, move the system along. And I think there's a lot of different ways that, that those external leaders can do it. I mean, it's not just moving towards being housing focused. It can be moving forward in ways that are embracing equity, right? And, and we can have a good equity lens from an external person. There's uh, people who can develop partnership and really looking at the synergy between people who uh, are working in this space together, who uh, all intersect with the shelter system, but aren't necessarily shelter providers. And I think there's a synergy that can happen there. Um, and then the other thing that I'll say outside the shelter system is uh, really looking to people that have been through your programs who have moved on from your programs and tapping into that voice of lived experience, drawing out their uh, influence of informing policy and informing service delivery as we move forward, I think is uh, critical to success. Um, you know, I, I think the they are not necessarily uh, all people with lived expertise. Uh, many uh, people with lived experience though do have expertise that they can share with us on how it can make our programs and services a little bit better. Uh, I'm going to um, start to wind down. I, I do want to um, uh, ask uh, one question of each of you. This is the wrap up question that um, I'm just dropping on you now because none of you knew it was coming. Uh, start with you, Sean. What do you wish you knew then that you know now? Uh, everything, I think, but um, <laughs> I wish I'd known how long it would take, I think, uh, because the, the uncertainty and sometimes the feeling of ambiguity, like what the hell are we doing and why are we still doing it this way, <laughs> you know, begins to sort of take, take, take hold. So when you're trying to constantly reassure, and I think each of us have spoken a little bit to that, um, you know, keeping people engaged and, you know, seeing those results and then, you know, being able to ride some of those waves. I wish I'd, I wish I'd known uh, that this would take as long as it has. And then, I, uh, you know, now we're at that place where I feel quite comfortable, as does everyone here, that the process, we know now that it doesn't end, that the process just continues and continues and continues. So I, I feel like I wish I would have known just how long it would take to, to begin to see uh, those results. Kevin, what do you wish you knew then that you know now? I think how important our internal triage is and knowing and engaging with the clients the way that we do today than what we did at the beginning. Um, you know, and really using our data to drive our programs um, has been a 
the biggest change and the biggest enlightenment for me. And James, what do you wish that you had known uh, or that the organization had known uh, back once upon a time uh, when you first went into it that you know now? I, I, I think we know now that, um, and I kind of mentioned this before, that um, it, it really does take a community to um, reduce homelessness in a community. None, not one of our organizations, as big as we are, um, uh, not as big as the, the Calgary drop-in is, can do it alone. Um, sometimes I think we think we can. Um, and I think we, we kind of start to think internally about, and I think we have to, you know, how, how, do we, how do we become a better organization? But, you know, we, we have got to open our doors and our windows and share in, in all successes and failures um, within our communities. Um, in, in a far more transparent way. It's, and it's hard to do because we are in competition with our partners for staff, for media, for money. And, and so there's that tension, but we've got to overcome that tension and, and find, find a way uh, to go forward uh, sometimes into that, you know, into that dark night together. Thank you. I'm just, uh, again, I'm focused on the Q&A uh, panel here. There are a couple more questions uh, for the sake of time. I do think that we need to wind down. Uh, there was a question here around the specifics of what partnering looks like and a question here around how COVID-19 has impact housing focused shelters. Um, and I think, Kevin, you've spoken to how it's actually presented opportunity in your organization to do a lot of things uh, in ways that are more rapid uh, and house people. But for those people who put in questions that we haven't been able to get to today, I would encourage you to follow up with the specific panelists. Uh, they or their um, uh, partners, I'm sure, can respond in time. I want to thank uh, all the attendees. This is a well-attended webinar. I also want to put in another plug for the Canadian Shelter Transformation Network. Go to transformshelter.ca. Uh, it is an increasingly uh, fantastic resource with lots of material for you to think about in this journey. And uh, we continue to brainstorm in the space with uh, the co-chairs and other memberships, other members uh, of figuring out uh, next steps for the Shelter Transformation Network. With that, uh, we have gone over time. Uh, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness for, and in particular, Michelle for organizing this. Thanks to Sandra Clarkson for kicking us off today. And thank you to uh, James and Sandra for their co-chairing and leadership in the Canadian Shelter Transformation space. Bye for now.